is Jessica Wolf. I work as a prosecutor in the 167th District Court for Travis County with Judge Wahlberg, and my entire caseload is child abuse. So I do child sexual abuse and child physical abuse, and my other part of the caseload is also animal cruelty. So um, I know. Um, she has all the fun stuff at the I know, office. I know. Right. But so right. that's what I'm assigned to. I just wanted to give you a little bit of uh, information about me before we proceed. And my name is Allie Crowley. I am also an assistant district attorney, and I am in the Special Victims Unit Civil Division. So I handle the child welfare cases, so termination of parental rights, working closely with Child Protective Services. And see, I feel the same way about your case. Look, yeah. It sounds really fun. They are fun, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. So we are really thrilled to be here to talk to you about um, how we can work together and make your lives easier and make our lives easier and ultimately, in, on behalf of children, make their, their cases a little bit more uh, thoroughly investigated and treated. So um, the first thing I wanted to start off with is that if you think about your roles, and our roles, and I know, I didn't know that we'd have nurses in here, so I'm sorry I didn't include you, but I'm really, <laughs> but don't worry, you'll be included throughout the entire pr um, presentation. But I, I'm assuming we have a lot of first responders in here. Can you raise your hand if you are EMS or fire? Okay, so a majority of you guys. You guys are what we consider the first responders, and I put first in quotations, because you may be the first person for that particular incident or for that particular episode that you may be helping with, but that child or your patient or the individuals you're working with could have a long history that you have no idea about. So I put first in quotes, and then I also put that we are kind of the last that they work with at the end, but you know there are emotional consequences, physical consequences that last a very long time. But for the most part, we are the faces of who these children are going to be interacting with. Um, so just to keep that in mind and keep that in perspective. Can so, I ask, um, how many of y'all have testified before in a criminal case or um, a civil case? Testified? So a handful of you. Okay, so let us know too if there's things, the experiences that y'all had in there that you would like to, you know, for us to address or talk through. And can I see those hands one more time that testified? Now raise your hand if you've received a subpoena to testify. <laughs> okay, there you go. So a lot more of you guys have had subpoenas. So you were close, but I don't know if you want to say you were lucky or not, but you got out of <laughs> testifying, right? And out of all the wait time that is involved with testifying. So we had a few questions for you to begin with, and that is to understand your role a little bit more so that we can help you. And our first question to you is, what is the purpose of your report? So if you are a first responder, what is the purpose, do you think, uh, memorializing facts in your report is? What's the point? Anybody? Yeah, I, yeah. how about a show of hands? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Immediately, if I know that, especially if I know, oh, <laughs> I have a loud enough voice, I could probably do without it. Yeah. Um, I know that for me personally, if, especially if I'm like, this is a total ch child abuse case, it's huh? pretty recognizable, um, that I pretty much, I write my report and I ask questions and I do things very specifically thinking that I am going to court, I'm going to be sitting, um, being questioned. Uh, so I, I kind of yeah. approach it like that when I do mine. And just as a follow-up question to that, when you're approaching it that way, how are you approaching the report writing process? Like as thorough as I possibly can be. I mean, every little detail that I am finding that relates to um, you know, my job as it pertains to what we do. Okay, yeah. um, great answer. There's someone behind you that also has an answer. My goal on those type of, any report is to paint a picture of what I saw, what I observed, what I did, and what was told to me, whether for patient care purposes, or, uh, billing purposes, or for uh, criminal justice purposes. That, that's a great answer. Both of those answers combined is exactly how we look at your reports. And for those of you who have testified, how long it was it from the time that you wrote your report to the time you showed up in court and testified? Or received the subpoena. No, <laughs> received the subpoena. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Years. Three years. Yep. Three years when I went, yeah. And so, you know, writing that report, getting as much information in there, very, very helpful probably to, you know, three years later when you're going in to know better what happened and to you know, help jog your memory on it. 
how many calls you think you handled between the time of that writing the report and then testifying? Probably more like maybe three, four hundred maybe. Three? Three hundred maybe. Lots, right? It's funny because that's actually something that defense attorneys will sometimes ask um, when you're on the stand to say, well, you can't possibly really remember this. There's been how many times have you gone out on a similar call? And so the reports can be incredibly useful um, mm -hmm. helping you there. Next question. Are you typing these reports in your vehicle or are you going back to an office or a desk or a laptop to type these reports up? And I don't just mean the narrative portion. I mean all the other medical data as well. Yes, with the stripes. I'm typically writing my report on my way back to the station while the information is as fresh as possible and before I get another call. So um, if I haven't finished it on the way back, then I finish it once I get to the station, but usually still on the same laptop. Okay. Is that the general consensus? Anybody do anything any differently? Okay. Um, do you ever take photographs or do you only rely on law enforcement to memorialize what you've seen? I see a no. Does anybody ever take... No, no one ever takes photographs. And then y'all, ha I see a yes back there. So are y'all also um, EMS? Um, I took an EMS job that I had before this one, and so we would, we would get on scene, and I would just take the iPhone and just take pictures as I walked along, primarily to show physicians in the emergency room. Thank you. Okay. Um, and so that was the main purpose of it. And, and we would attach them to the chart, and you could see damage of the car and everything on the scene, you know, before we lifted. That's great. That's good for us to know because oftentimes, so the state is obligated to turn over anything that we have in our possession. And even though it's not at our office, we're on the same team. So if you've got it on your iPhone, I have to know. And the only way I'm going to know is if you write it in that report, right? So if you're ever taking pictures, just make sure that there's some indication in the report that you took your own pictures. We're not saying that you are the investigator and you're doing all of the you know, law enforcement um, obligations of collecting and looking at the evidence or anything like that. We're just saying if you are there taking photographs for whatever reason, may it be for the purpose of medical treatment, you've got to let us know. Okay. Um, do you only write information on the patient receiving treatment? Do you only write information on the patient receiving the treatment? No, I usually write like um, quotations, you know, from what people said. You mm -hmm. know, subjective. In oh, oh, thank you. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> Testing. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I want to burst into song now. Um, <laughs> you usually like write, um, you know, I, whatever information other people told you as much as you can, like paraphrase, quotations, okay. whatever you saw, whatever, um, whatever the scene presented itself, whatever, not evidence, but whatever, you know, whatever objects you saw at the scene or. Great. Great. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And she had her son with her who was pretty young, so I also documented just to make sure I saw nothing going on with him because I knew that that was something to be concerned about. Absolutely. And that kind of goes back to what was stated earlier that you want to paint a picture, right? Mm -hmm. Like if I don't know that there's somebody else in the room or affected by some of the actions that have happened or the episode that had already occurred, we don't have a fully fleshed out picture of what the scene is like and you guys are the first ones there. Do you document history provided by parents and guardians? Good. And have you ever updated, supplemented, or added an addendum to your report? Yes. Okay. And when does that happen? <laughs> okay, so go back and say, you know, I didn't include this, but I recall this later on. Great. That's super important because um, oftentimes defense attorneys will say, well, you didn't add it. And I know you have, mm -hmm. you say you have an independent memory of this happening afterwards, but don't you have the ability to edit your narrative or don't you have the ability, don't you have the time? Wasn't this important enough for you? It's important enough for you today to testify about it, but for some reason you didn't think it was necessary to update your report. Okay? That's one of their favorites is yeah. that if it was so important, why isn't it in your report? And, and why so. is this the first time we're ever <laughs> hearing about it? So the reason why we ask you these questions is so that your mind starts thinking about where we're headed. Headed, okay, so let's talk about documentation. We've been talking about it all along, but the things that you guys are obviously do is that you note all possible injuries. Um, and I'm gonna let Allie talk about why it's really important to note the demeanor of the patient as well. 
you know, depending on the type of scene, you walked into a domestic violence scene, and I love the fact that you look for the child as well and how the child is doing. But later on in court, um, depending on, uh, Justin and I have different rules that apply as to what can be said in court. But we both, um, the rules of evidence allow for you to talk about what a person told you um, if you can show that it was uh, what we call an excited utterance. And so if you're putting in the report that um, victim or patient was very upset, she was crying, she was you know, a very, very emotional when she was giving me the information, that is very helpful to us because we know then that when it comes time to testify and we can help say, you know, what was her demeanor when you got there and you say all of that, it can help get additional information in. And again, I think somebody mentioned it with report writing. It paints a picture. And so the more we can show the, the jury or show the judge is incredibly helpful. And in the same vein, when we say the demeanor of the patient, words like sad, angry, helpful but not as helpful as she was crying she her her she couldn't look at me in the eyes or she had a shortness of breath when she was talking because she couldn't catch her breath because she was a, she was crying so hard or she started backing away those sort of descriptors mm -hmm. will help jog your memory but also i mean it also paints a picture for the jury later on or the judge um, when you testify of exactly what that patient or child was doing um, also, what's important is for you when you're making notations in your report that your statements, some of the statements are gonna be background and that's totally fine. But if you can somehow link whatever you're writing as a statement made for the purpose of diagnosis or treatment. So I'll back up a little bit. And I know a lot of you guys have watched crime and drama shows and you've heard objection hearsay, right? So typically any statement out of court is gonna be hearsay but there are certain exceptions, and Allie already told you about one, excited utterance. The statement, oh my gosh, he just slapped me, I'm so scared of him. That statement's gonna come in if you can lay the foundation that she said that statement out of excitement. You can also admit statements made by anybody there if the statement was made for the purpose of medical diagnosis or treatment. Because there's an understanding in law that the patient is going to be more forthright with you because they're seeking help, right? So when a child tells a nurse, you know, um, he touched me uh, in my vagina and it stung. And you say, well, where's your vagina and, and what part? Those types of statements, if it's made for medical diagnosis or treatment, potentially an examination or a, or a diagnosis of that nature, that statement, he touched me, is going to start coming in, okay? And it's going to be very helpful in the prosecution of child abuse cases. And sometimes we see his, you know, the medical history can go into, into that as well. I mean, one of the reasons you get medical history is that it may be the current cause or an impact on the situation that you currently find the patient in. And so, um, see this a lot in child abuse and the physical cases um, if there's been prior abuse you know that you're noticing um, past bruising and things of that nature then the, the patient giving you that information is for the purpose of of medical treatment you're you know, kind of the holistic approach to it but it definitely can get in if if we phrase it that way and remember, medical diagnosis and treatment isn't just the physical ailment that you're seeing um, getting treated in the ED. Um, it's also psychological statements, right? He, he has threatened me. Um, I, I have suicidal tendencies. Those are going to be made for the purpose of medical diagnosis and treatment, even if it's not for an actual physical ailment. So you hit the nail on the head about using direct quotes. Direct quotes are really important. Direct quotes, if you can actually obviously set them off with the quotations, we know that those are the words coming from the child's mouth or from the mother's mouth or from the father's mouth. That helps us understand what we can use in court. And it also helps us refresh the memory of that witness when, we came, when they come in later. For example, we'll say, Mr. So-and-so, um, did you have a discussion with EMS? Yes, I did. Um, do you remember saying you know, these words, something like this? And they'll be like, oh yeah, I did say that. So you memorializing it can help the witness later on as well. You need to keep in mind that sometimes you're treating the victim but also sometimes they're treating the defendant as well. So who here has actually given treatment to somebody that was eventually the accused? 
a lot of you guys, right? So you may be actually the first person who's talking to the defendant and all the statements that the defendant is making is going to be admissible. Allie, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, this is so note immediate surroundings if relevant. I, I think we both see this come into play but in our child abuse, uh, the child welfare cases. Um, we want to know what's going on in the home as much as possible. You go, you show up at a home, uh, you've been called out, you go inside and you see, you know, beer cans are all over the place or the house is in disarray or whatever the situation is. There's, you know, there's a bong out in the corner. Um, things like this that you see can be incredibly helpful to us in, again, painting the picture, but knowing what's really going on in the home. So yes, there is a physical injury that you're there to assess and to treat, but helping us understand what the scene looked like is incredibly helpful and can provide information that at the time might not seem relevant, but you know, there being a lot of, a lot of alcohol around. Um, and I'm not talking about the, the bottle of wine that's on the kitchen counter. I mean, y'all, Y'all show up at a lot of places, you know kind of what you're looking for. But That's giving our us, counters. yeah, I was gonna say, That's not ours. that. <laughs> <laughs> but so, you know, showing us through your writing what you're actually seeing helps us know more about what's going on, more about just the physical injury that you're there to treat. And let me also caveat that with we're not here to throw, you know, throw people in jail willy nilly and just prosecute people for hunches that we have, a lot of your observations can also help that person not be wrongfully accused. So if a child has an injury and they're nonverbal, we don't want to just jump to child abuse because it's very like, it could be equally likely that it was an accident. But if the history is inconsistent with the surroundings that you see, that's when you should take note. Mm -hmm. If it is consistent, also helpful to take note because that could make sure that we're not prosecuting somebody that shouldn't be prosecuted, which is not what we want to do. Um, we mentioned drugs, alcohol, and weapons. Um, also note the behavior of the parties if you find them relevant. Um, you have been on scenes where people are really, really upset and crying because that may be the natural reaction. Have you ever been on scene where it is crazy, but somebody has a completely different reaction, one that you did not expect? I'm getting a lot of nods. So a guy in the white cap, I'm sure you can project loud enough that we don't need the mic, but can you tell <laughs> us about that circumstance? Wow. And did your report reflect that she walked out and was like seemingly uninterested at what happened? Super helpful. And let's say that that culminates into nothing, right? Nothing. But later down the line, something's going on with that mother and that child. We're going to pull all the reports and calls to that house, and we're going to see that report. So you may get a call or a subpoena one day to talk about other instances that happened that may not be completely related to the one that we're going to trial on, but you noticed something that was consistent with something that may be important to the case. And with all of the documentation, these cases, first of all, there might not be anything that's going on that where the case ends up at the DA's office but it may be a situation almost all of you if not all of you are mandatory reporters correct yes um, and so the information you know may go to child protective services and they may not actually read you know get pulled the report but the referral will mimic that information and can be very very helpful to CPS in determining is this something that needs you know more investigation from them. And so even legal cases aside, it is very helpful to the other um, child welfare folks who may come into interaction with the family. And the purpose is to cue the reader, right? You have no idea how many other people are going to be reading your reports one day. So I would also spell check and <laughs> check your grammar. I, I, I need to do that myself on my emails too, but there are going to be many eyes that pass through your reports as short as they are or as long as they are, somebody's gonna look at them and they're gonna associate that report with your name. So just make sure that you're cueing the reader as to what's going on. But I would say the most important thing is use phrases that you know you would use to cue yourself as to that circumstance, right? In the circumstance where she walked out of the room, I mean, you're writing things down where in three or four years, you're gonna remember that particular incident. 
okay? And I know that you go on calls that are not of note, but remember, the way you write can cue yourself to jog your memory because you're gonna be an essential witness um, in a case, potentially. Okay, so we wanted to do, and I know it's super small for you guys, um, we wanted to look at, we only have 30 minutes, so we wanted to show you bad narratives and good narratives. There's tons of bad narratives out there, but we only have time to show you a good one. So I'm gonna try to read it out loud, and some of the acronyms, I don't even know what they mean, but hopefully you can help <laughs> me. And then we're gonna dissect what makes this a good narrative, okay? So it says DM4 dispatch for a 13-year-old female with CC of head, CC, anyone? Ah, right arm, mm -hmm. right leg, and abdomen PN post-assault? Abdomen pain post-assault. Patient states that her stepfather got very angry, in quotes, and began pushing her and pulled her by the hair and punched her with a closed fist several times in the head at her school. And then once they arrived at home, he began punching her again and pulling her by the hair. Patient states that when he had her by the hair, he threw her down onto the ground using her hair. Patient states that once she was on the ground, he began kicking her in the head, leg, and abdomen. Patient states that the assailant also struck her with a belt multiple times in the arm and leg. Patient states that this is not the first time the assailant has attacked her. Patient states that each time it has happened, it has gotten worse. Patient states that she is afraid of the assailant and that she is scared she might he, she, quote, might die when he kicks me in, in my stomach and my head. Upon EMS arrival, found patient standing outside with her aunt and grandmother. Patient has been crying and states that her head hurts. Patient has rough, roughly a three by two inch hematoma to the right side of her head. Multiple red welts to the right arm and leg and midline upper abdomen tenderness. Patient denies any LOC loss of consciousness, and is able to recall the incident in its entirety. Patient states that when he was kicking her in the stomach and afterwards, she felt like she needed to vomit. Patient states she was gagging when he was kicking her in the abdomen. Patient states that she was unable to stand on her own after the assault due to feeling dizzy. Patient's mother had interrupted the assault and told the assailant that she was calling 911, which then led to the assailant to flee. Patient weighs roughly 140 pounds, and the assailant weighs roughly 200 pounds. Patient has a GCS of 4, 5, 6 equals 15. What does that mean? <laughs> okay. Good job. <laughs> Good job. And is A and O times 4. Alert and oriented, right? Okay. Patient denies any other complaints at this time. Transport to... SAH per mother's request, transfer to, of care to RN. Just prior to transporting the patient, she stated that her back was sore. EMS lifted the back of the patient's shirt to find one inch red welts mid back to the right of her spine, which are tender on palp. EM2560, is that someone in this room? EM2560? No. Okay. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, well, good job. If, yeah, it's if great to work. Report. Okay. So that's a lot of information, right? This was a, this was a case, it is closed now. This child um, was a victim of, of child abuse. So the first thing we talked about, quotes, right? Very angry, super helpful. After the yellow of very angry, um, can someone tell us what makes this so good? Why we appreciate it? Yeah, her, what she stated and a lot of the descriptors, right? He began pushing her and pulled her by the hair. I mean, it's almost like a play-by-play -play mm -hmm. that the child is giving as to what happened, and it's, it's in a very sequential order. Now, guess, all children are different, but do you think that when a prosecutor like me comes in for the first time and we've developed a rapport and I ask her about it, do you think that she's going to immediately say it the way she said it to you? She's probably said it or relived it or thought about it. She's internalizing. She just want to see somebody else like me to ask her about the entire event. But this helps me understand how to approach asking her questions because the person who would listen to her first and is going to give medical help that isn't her mom, isn't her dad, and isn't a family member, it's you guys, was able to write down pretty much exactly what she said as it happened, right after it happened. Why is this significant? I highlighted not the first time. 
Right, yeah. right. And it goes back to what we we're talking about before, you know, for purpose of medical treatment and diagnosis, but it, it tells us, I mean, those four words give us more information than almost anything else. I mean, we know that it's ongoing. We know that this isn't the first time. It's very helpful um, in us understanding what the dynamic is in the home. And it also builds her credibility. If, if she didn't say that to you and you didn't write it down, and then she tells us, well, it's been happening for a really long time. Possible, very possible. But it's even more credible if she told you that it wasn't the first time and then she tells me it's not the first time. That kind of lends her whole story so much more and people are gonna be bound to believe her because at every juncture she has said, this was not the first assault. Yes? <laughs> So any, any statement, just, just because you said it off in quotes doesn't make it not hearsay. It's the surrounding circumstances in which she is saying those things that make it not hearsay, right? So because she was actually in, I didn't add her picture because I was like, if the point is to show her crying, I can't black out her face, you would never see her crying. <laughs> but she, they took a picture right then and there in the back of an EMS truck and she was just red faced and crying, which is exactly what this is demonstrating to me. But that, if I show the picture to the judge and I say this is what this EMS person says she says this is going to f very squarely fall under the excited excited utterance statement because yeah, the reason that hearsay isn't allowed in court is because it's thought to be unreliable you know if you've got kids and kids are reporting what their sibling did we all kind of take it with a grain of salt it's not always the most reliable um, but there are things that add reliability to out-of-court statements and those are the exceptions so if somebody is um, the excited utterance, you know, very upset, says something spontaneously, that leads to its credibility. The other part of it for the quotations is that depending on, um, for, for Jess, it's gonna be the defendant, for me, it's gonna be either of the parents. Um, things that they said can be used in court. And so the quotes, when it comes from the victim and comes from, I mean, really anybody, we can make the determination later on if we're gonna get it in, but it's helpful because we can use that statement against that person. And so it's just, it just goes to the reliability of the statement. Quotes tell us that it came directly from that person and it helps us know whether or not we might be able to use it in the future. And so just to answer your question a little bit more directly, paraphrasing is fine. The point is though, as long as it cues you to the conversation you had, assuming that it happens three years later, like that conversation that I asked, hey, what'd she say? That it can, it, it can jog your memory sufficiently. Now, I love it when there are quotes because in cross-examination, they'll be like, are you sure that's what she said? Well, I put it in quotes. Mm -hmm. I only put it in quotes if that's exactly what she says. Boom, that's the end of that discussion, right? <laughs> so if it is something so important or so detailed, I would go ahead and try to quote it. And if they may ask you further, how do you know this is a direct quote? Because I wrote it in my little spiral notepad that I carry right in my left pocket. I know it's a quote, that sort of thing. So just picture what a defense attorney would say to try to skew that conversation. Are you sure you're not confusing it with the other child that you talked to two years later? That sort of thing. Okay, another quote, might I, die when he kicks me in my stomach and my head. Did I miss someone's question? Yeah, we've got a question. Yes, yes ma'am. Uh, we use a lot of abbreviations and acronyms. Is that going to be a problem? No, because I'll just call you and ask you what it means. I mean, we Way do too, before. and so it's, we're used to it too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, patient has been crying. Like I said, it gives us that excited utterance exception. It's not always has, it doesn't always have to be crying, right? It could be a lot of other things that could be an excited utterance. Oh my gosh, that mm -hmm. they were just in a car accident and I just saw him pull that girl out and beat her in the head. Like it doesn't have to be crying. Um, we love the, um, the injuries that are noted with actual dimensions, oftentimes we get pictures and we have no way to scale them. Like, how do I know that that was that big? Well, if you measured it, that helps us um, with a scale. Oftentimes uh, law enforcement forgets to put something like a ruler next to a giant gash or something like that. And we have to recreate it and uh, it's just a lot more difficult. So, and then she felt like she needed to vomit afterwards. That tells us the severity of the beating that she under underwent. Okay, why is this important? 
it gives us a picture as to what's going on, right? That she's 140 and that he's 200 pounds, that this wasn't a fair fight. This is an adult on a child. And that's a great detail. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really, we can't stress enough, details like that um, help a lot for us to understand, again, what's going on and the, um, the difference between them. And uh, kind of on a slight tangent, do I have any police officers in here? People just, oh. <laughs> People like first responders, juries like first responders yes, and firefighters way more than they like police officers in today's climate. So when, if an officer wrote a report like this, they may be like accused of writing it for the purpose of prosecution and assisting in making their case. Whereas you're just trying to tell what happened, right? So I really can't stress enough how much I have never had a jury come back and say, that EMS person hated them. Yeah. How, I can't tell you how many times they're like, that officer so-and-so, he'd write me a ticket in a heartbeat. I hate mm -hmm. that guy. You know, So <laughs> it's one of those things like you have built-in credibility, so use it to your advantage. Yes? We can definitely do it that way. But if we do it that way, you're relying heavily on us to, uh, to look at this is, right. Yeah. This yeah. tells us that it was important. Um, I mean, you're gonna get all of their, you know, their weight, the blood pressure, things like that. But this points out that the, the EMT that was there saw this and said, oh, I mean, this is a big guy beating up on this, on this child and it's important. And so that is, it's helpful to know what y'all thought about it too. We rely heavily on your impressions of things. Um, and I don't know if I'd always get the defendant's weight. I mean, I can eyeball him and I don't know what, I mean, he may go into custody and they, uh, they may not weigh him there. So I might not always have the full picture of what he's like. He could, uh, if trials are later, I've seen it so many different ways where the perpetrator comes in looking one way and then mm -hmm. when we're at trial, they look totally different. They've either gained a lot of weight on the jail diet, lost a lot of weight on the you know jail diet, who knows? Yeah, and certainly our victims the same way, especially since they have grown. I mean, most of the time it's a couple of years later. And so being able to show what this little girl was like at five years old and how she looked compared to now when she's eight or nine years old. I mean, my last case, the last few trials I've had, they were just um, that, they were about three or four year ago, uh, incident occurrence date. And the child was in fourth or fifth grade at the time, and now they're awkward middle schoolers mm. or about to be freshmen in high school, and they've got a little bit of a different demeanor now. So what we would do is we would pull their yearbook pictures if their parents don't have pictures and know the exact date um, of when this happened and how they looked. That's helpful, but it's even more helpful for something like this. That's, they're both helpful. Okay. So um, for those of you that have testified, I'm sure you did a phenomenal job, but you can always be better. Um, the one, <laughs> we want you to always respond to subpoenas. We, ha we send subpoenas all day, every day, it feels mm -hmm. like sometimes. And I know you get them and you're like, oh, here's another one, I bet you I won't testify. Please respond to them so we know that you got them. A lot of us try to send, or a lot of prosecutors mm -hmm. try to have their subpoenas sent through email. It's just easier than sending one of our investigators to hand serve you. And I know a lot of you get service through your actual organization that you're with. But respond, shoot an email or um, a, a phone call over and say, hey, I, I got it, just let me know. And the reason why is because I can ch check that one line item off my list. But on top of that, I have your contact information so I can work with you on your schedule. You wanna meet with me at 4 p.m.? I'm gonna make that happen because you responded to my subpoena. If you don't respond, I'm gonna say, show up at 9 a.m. and wait. Okay, so respond. Yeah. And I told Jess when we were talking about the presentation, I was in a jury trial last week and I subpoenaed a therapist for these kids and she hasn't responded. I can see that she was served. She hasn't returned a phone call. I mean, I've done everything to try and reach her and I'll keep doing that because it is, it's a travesty that she didn't you know, respond to the subpoena and show up to be there for these children. Um, and so even though it's over and done with, I mean, I haven't let it go yet. Um, I'm still trying to, <laughs> I'm still trying to reach her, but yeah, the, just half the time they don't go. So just call us. Call us, let us get your information, and then hopefully, you know, most likely we'll be calling you before trial going, you know what, we settled. Uh, thank you so much. And then most of the time we've got your cell phone number. Um, and so it makes it easier in the future. But we do our best to work with y'all and 
the only way that can happen is if you you know respond when you do get subpoenaed and a lot of responses we've also gotten have been can this just be a phone meeting please <laughs> can we just prepare for trial over the phone no <laughs> if i'm going to send somebody to prison for 40 years you and i are going to meet in person we're going to talk and you're going to you're going to get all your butterflies out and we're going to figure out what the defense is going to say and we're going to do it together we're not going to prepare over the phone it's not good enough it's not good enough for a case that's worth that many years of someone's life be prepared um I have had times <laughs> where I have to print out the reports for them and like just sit there and watch them read for about 10 minutes and it gets really awkward. If you can, review your notes ahead of time and ask the ADA to email you a copy of your report if you don't have time to pull it up yourself just so you have it on your phone or wherever you check your email and review it prior to coming so that we can be efficient with our time. You're just going to wait way longer and it's going to get real awkward if you're not prepared. And do you all have access, so if you wrote a report three years ago, um, assuming you still work for the same agency, is that relatively easy for y'all to access? Once we have the names and stuff, yeah. Okay. It's good to know, because I'm never sure if, if you have the same access that, you know, I've got it in front of me. But let us know if you don't, if you don't have access to it, we can help you out. And I see Ms. King in the back. That means we need to wrap it up. Uh, we have a lot. <laughs> a few things. I'm going to just go over it real, really quickly. Know your protocols. That means know how calls are coded. Know, know why you do certain things before uh, you testify because th we're going to ask you because you have to build your own credibility as an EMS personnel. Also, know relevant details. I absolutely think it's appalling if you come in to testify and you don't know the victim's name or her age at the time of the call or the address of the call or who your partners were. Those are things that should roll off the tongue because it's, it's about preparation and seeming like a cohesive team. Know the victim's name and age, address of the call, and the other EMS personnel that were out there with you. And really quickly to end it, and we'll be a part of the panel discussion, this was actually in a different um, state, but it was a shaken baby type case. And the EMS person, um, multiple, three EMS uh, personnel ended up testifying. But what I thought this was really, in was really interesting is that in the article it says that this first responder, the prosecutor quoted what the first responder reported about, that he immediately noticed bruising around the child's forehead. And the child was only seven months at the time. And he testified that the baby was as white as a sheet of paper and had blue color around his lips, indicating he wasn't getting enough oxygen. Low, the EMS person, also said the child's eyes were open and one pupil was dilated, while the other was constricted. He said that that was a sign of brain injury. Like, this is painting a picture that the jury deserves to hear and the story of a seven-month-old who deserves to have that story told. Another important part of this article that I thought was interesting was that... So they also noted um, some other things around the scene. He was standing there, he wasn't crying, wasn't acting in my perception as a father should. They're usually climbing on my back asking, where's my child going? I'm going with you. That EMS person remembers that incident and ultimately had to testify in a very big trial that obviously got media scrutiny, okay? So you are a huge piece of the puzzle. And I know you'll have probably some questions that we'll do during the panel discussion, and I'm sorry for going over. No. Thank you guys so much, though, for, for listening and <laughs> for what y'all do. Um.